Thanks, okay. Annabelle. And thanks to all of you. Oh, thanks to all of you for such a great time and session. I feel restored. And now I want to introduce briefly our night's keynote um, speaker. So when it comes to transformation and being radical, I think our next speaker might be able to give us some idea what that's about. Ajamu Baraka is from Chicago and um, spent time as executive director of the Human Rights, Human Rights Network, I think so. You're gonna have to correct me Ajamu because I may have gotten it wrong. Um, also done lots of international organizing and founded Black Alliance for Peace. Also in 2016, Ajamu Baraka was vice presidential candidate on the ticket for the Green Party. So that is my brief and thorough introduction. Ajamu, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, George. And thank everyone uh, for allowing me to be part of this very important uh, conversation. I had a chance to uh, listen to some of the discussion uh, before this uh, session and found it quite uh, quite enlightening. <clears throat> You know, this is this is, in fact, a, a very uh, important day, as we have already said a few times. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I take away from the Supreme Court decision today uh, was that it was, in fact, a reminder of the precariousness of the situation that we are facing here uh, in this country as it relates to our fundamental uh, democratic and and human rights. Uh, we're reminded of the absolute necessity for radical change. That the democratic and human rights that we think that we have secured through struggle uh, can be taken back, recuperated, when the recognition by the rulers that the protection and fulfillment of fundamental rights are seen as impediments to their rule and to their agenda. You know, I heard a few people uh, allude to uh, Loretta Ross, and I thought about her a lot today also, uh, because in this um, decision today, Roe v. Wade, uh, I remember the cutting edge work that Loretta uh, was and still is involved in. Uh, her and other uh, Black and African women, colonized women um, who had, were on the cutting edge, who are still on the cutting edge of, of constructing a framework that not only addressed the issue of abortion rights, the, the autonomy, the independence of the bodies of non-men, but directed us toward the systemic and systematic transformations that had to take place to expand the range of rights. Uh, and that framework, we all know, is the framework of reproductive justice. We're reminded of that again, because when you have a uh, situation where we are able to uh, exercise uh, rights in their fullest sense, when there is in fact real sovereignty of the people, when power resolve, re resolves, it resides with the people, then the people are not gonna turn on themselves. And that's why it's very important for us to uh, understand that, that no matter what uh, areas of work that we are engaged in, uh, the ultimate uh, objective has to be the transformation of society, which means uh, the building of independent political power. So uh, I'm going to be quite concrete uh, in my language this evening. Um, I think this is the period in which uh, it's precise uh, and perhaps maybe even simple uh, as we can be uh, in identifying the issues that we are facing and um, collectively examining 
possible solutions is exactly what we have to do. You know, this assault today uh, reminded us also of another uh, snatching back of rights uh, that took place in uh, 2013 when the Supreme Court reversed uh, or eliminated uh, the preclearance for the Voting Rights Act. All of these things, uh, again, remind us of where we need to go and what we need to do in terms of building an opposition. <clears throat> so um, I wanna share how we might do that and share and do that by a, a brief examination of the approach that, uh, that we take in the Black Alliance for Peace. Um, and that might resonate with, with the work that uh, uh, you all are involved in um, here and in your other uh, places, because we, we all know we wear multiple hats in this struggle in this country. Uh, and it speaks to what I'm gonna share, uh, what we think needs to be done in terms of the focus on uh, structural change uh, and the absolute necessity for building power in order to realize that structural change. We are informed in the Black Alliance of Peace um, by a commitment to radical change. Uh, someone said earlier that uh, they felt that peace was everything. I think I think George said that. And in, in, in some ways, it really is. But it is the understanding that peace uh, is arrived at as a consequence of struggle when you live in a society and in the world where you have some social forces that are committed uh, to uh, uh, chaos, uh, structural violence, uh, war. Uh, the desire for peace has to go beyond just a desire. It has to uh, be informed by an understanding that in order to be able to realize peace, again, you have to have real fundamental change. That perspective is what we uh, referred to and referred to as the Black radical peace tradition that we believe should inform how we look at this question of peace. And, and let me explain why. We say in, in the definition of the Black radical peace tradition that peace is not the absence of conflict but rather the achievement by popular struggle and self-defense of a world liberated from the interlocking issues of global conflict, nuclear armament and proliferation, unjust war and subversion through the defeat of global systems of oppression that include colonialism, imperialism, patriarchy and white supremacy. Again, that we say and we see that the achievement of peace comes about when one identifies the issues that uh, undermine peace and that those issues are, are primarily structural. So those global systems of oppression, colonialism, imperialism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. The other interconnected framework that informs our work is the people-centered human rights framework. Um, and the people-centered human rights framework is a framework that says that uh, people-centered human rights are those non-oppressive rights that reflect the highest commitment to universal human dignity and social justice that individuals and collectives define and secure for themselves through social struggle. Both of these frameworks developed uh, in the immediate years uh, after the Second Imperialist War or the war we refer to as uh, the Second World War. Um, and these, this framework is a framework that guided uh, the black radical work uh, that took place in those post-war years and the work that we embrace in the Black Alliance for Peace. So this is what we say has to divide, has to inform how we see the world and how we uh, address these issues. And we say that because you have to, we believe you have to identify 
the issues clearly. The people-centered human rights framework, for example, proceeds from the assumption that the genesis of the assault on human dignity that are at the core of human rights violations is located in the relationships of oppression. The people-centered human rights framework does not pretend to be non-political. It is a political project in the service of the oppressed. It names the enemies of freedom. And we say that the main enemies of freedom today on this planet is the Western white supremacist colonial capitalist patriarchy. We're clear about that and make no apologies for taking that kind of position. We say that the demands for clean water, safe and accessible food, free quality education, health care, and healthiness for all, housing, public transportation, wages, and a socially productive job that allow for the, a dignified life, the ending of mass incarceration, universal free child care, opposition to war and the control and eventual elimination of the police, self-determination and respect for democracy are all aspects of life that are informed uh, by the people-centered framework. It is a position that says again, that the people-centered human rights that we identify can only be realized through a bottom-up mass movement for, uh, for power, the process of building political power. So we say there can't be any ambiguity, especially at this critical moment in history. With the ruling class, the rulers uh, desperately attempted to try to maintain their uh, hegemony and the quite obvious position they have taken uh, that uh, they are prepared to utilize and have used a military first strategy to maintain uh, their hegemony. Uh, so we say that when we approach a social struggle at this particular moment, we have to ground ourselves in the understanding of the context. We say that the context determines the strategy. And let me share a couple of points on that, that we say there can be no ideological confusion. We must be clear in language that cannot be co-opted or commodified by the state or its associated institutions like liberal funders. So we must state in unequivocal language that it is the Western colonial capitalist imperialist system now led by the US that is responsible for the billions of human beings living in poverty. It is imperialism that degrades and destroys the earth, that makes water a commodity, food a luxury, education an impossibility, and healthcare a distant dream. It is the rapacious greed and absolute disregard for human life by imperialism that drives the arms trade, creates human incarceration into a uh, profitable enterprise and transforms millions into migrant migrants and refugees because of war and economic plunder. So we have to be clear. We have to be clear that the struggle is for power and that reform. Reformism is important, but it cannot be the, 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 the end point. It must be seen as a, uh, a path toward a uh, fundamental social transformation. We make demands against the state and system, but it is clear that those demands are in the context of a program for, in fact, winning power. Demands are strategic. Participating in the electoral system is strategic. Uh, the struggle for constitutional reform, abolition, all of these must be seen as aspects of the process of building dual and contending power. One second.
So my friends, that's where we are at today, uh, in my opinion, that we have to um, ensure that we understand that this moment that we're in, this historical moment that we're in at this, at this, at this time is fairly unique. Uh, we are at a uh, critical period where we are in a transition from one social system to something else, something else not yet completely known uh, and definitely not uh, yet named. But it's quite clear that the old uh, is going out. It's quite clear that the rulers can no longer rule in the same way. It's quite clear that millions of people around the world have determined that they want change, that they are no longer ready to accept living as subhumans, having their uh, dignity uh, assaulted, uh, being subjected to uh, subversion and war. Uh, they have uh, decided that they are going to transform their conditions and in the process, transform themselves. It is imperative that we understand, those of us in the West, at the center of empire, that we have a responsibility not only to ourselves, but a responsibility to the millions of people who are negatively impacted by the policies and behaviors of this state, this settler colonial state, and the uh, states in Western Europe that are its closest allies. We have to understand that uh, if we're going to be able to save ourselves, uh, when it's quite clear that this state uh, that is determined to maintain hegemony through force, uh, that if we don't put a break on those uh, desires, that all of us are facing the possibility of complete uh, destruction. Uh, the US state says quite clearly in its national security strategy that it is committed to full spectrum dominance. And that means not only uh, dominating the entire globe, but also dominating uh, its own citizens, the people who reside inside the US. Because in order to be able to have full uh, freedom to exercise this domination, to uh, plunder the people's resources, uh, uh, directing those resources to to the military, uh, uh, you have to have a core of, of support internally. And when you don't have massive support, you have to have the ability to repress. And we see that the repressive apparatus of the state has been strengthening over the last few years. Uh, and we have seen a very troubling move in the last couple of years, last four years or so, uh, primarily led by the neoliberal uh, forces that uh, dominate the Democratic Party and which control objectively the state, a move to uh, constrain and constrict thought, uh, critical analysis, uh, and speech. The you know what were supposed to be core liberal principles, but because of the deepening crisis, the deepening crisis of legitimacy, uh, the rulers have began to uh, create the conditions uh, for popular support. Uh, for undermining those core values, those core uh, principles. So these folks are serious and we have to be as serious and we have to be more serious than they are because the terms are much more serious for us that unless we're able to put a break on the policies and behaviors uh, of, this, uh, of this state, a state that operates as a rogue state, um, that we're not going to be able to control the uh, domestic army we refer to as the police. Uh, we're not going to be able to avoid the uh, uh, coming um, uh, proliferation of, of more conflicts as the states fight among themselves. Uh, we're not going to be able to address the critical issues, uh, the, the, the uh, existential issue we face uh, with global climate change. Um, we are not going to be able to survive as a species on this planet unless we are able to put a break on the ability of these Western states uh, to, uh, to threaten global humanity. Now, some might think that I think that I'm being too overly harsh on the West and there should be some kind of balance. Well, 
you know, um, I believe that we have to have that we have to make a distinction between what we see as the primary and secondary contradictions, uh, identify the primary enemies in clear, unambiguous terms. Uh, and for us in the Black Alliance for, for Peace, for example, uh, we say that the, the, the primary threat to global humanity is the US, EU, NATO axis of domination. This is the, the axis of domination responsible for millions of people losing their lives since 1945 in their desperate attempt to try to maintain a, a global colonial system. These are the states that have been responsible for some of the most horrendous crimes against humanity that we, that we have ever seen in the annals of human history. This is the state that has used a nuclear weapon on a people. This is a state that imposes crippling sanctions on more than 40 nations around the world, not because of any kind of issues around democracy, but because of their desire to control and to undermine uh, competitors, to intimidate people into compliance uh, with their agenda. It is a very uh, difficult thing, my friends, for us to, to frame these issues in this way, to come to terms with the fact that uh, we live in, in essence, a ongoing uh, criminal enterprise uh, that we are, that's called the United States of America. But we have no other, uh, we have no right not to, to see this the way millions of people around the world see it. We cannot continue to embrace uh, innocence. We cannot continue to believe that we can just make uh, incremental changes uh, continue to support uh, the, the duopoly uh, with emphasis on the Democratic Party and believe that uh, we, in fact, are going to be able to survive. This historical moment requires a radical response and, a, and radicalism, my friends, and that's something to be, to be uh, concerned with. Uh, a radical goes to the root of things. A radical is someone that thinks for themselves. A radical movement is a movement that is going to the core of the problems. So we embrace the term radicalism. Uh, radicals are in fact rational. Uh, radicals in fact are the ones that attempt to envision a new world, a new configuration of power, a new structure of how we uh, organize societies. That is our responsibilities as radicals to envision, to ground ourselves with the people, to collectively learn with the people, and to make radical change. So, uh, my friends, this is the task, in my in my opinion. Uh, we have to shake off all of the illusions. We have to uh, remind ourselves of our relative privilege, even those of us who are poor and working class. We have to uh, make a choice that either we are standing with the forces of change in this world, or, or we will find ourselves inadvertently often uh, propping up the legitimacy of this dying system uh, and propping up, uh, in fact, objectively, um, uh, white power. So we have some difficult days and we have a lot of internal work to do among ourselves to strip away the, the uh, obfuscation of liberalism, uh, to go to the core, uh, to, to uh, deconstruct uh, the, the, the inner workings of this system, uh, to pull back the, the veil of, of obscurantism so people can see clearly what it is that they're up against, but more importantly, uh, for us to offer the potential for a new kind of society and to help people to understand that collectively we in fact can build a new society. So this is our task and responsibilities. Uh, uh, we believe that is a task that uh, we are up to. Uh, we uh, believe passionately that we can um, uh, bring about radical change. Uh, we see that we are part of the majority of global humanity. 
um, and that it, once we understand that and understand that that is the, the irrationality of a minority of the population, that because of their status as owners, they're able to uh, hold back human development, that they're able to plunder the people and their resources. Um, you know, until we we get to the point where we understand that that is an irrational construction and that has to go in order for us to live, uh, then we will continue to face the kinds of uh, conditions we face today. But I have full confidence that uh, we are making changes. Uh, young people see the contradictions. Uh, young people are embracing uh, new frameworks of struggle. Um, and the possibility of us being successful, of winning, uh, is, is, is quite clear to me. So um, these kinds of gatherings that you all are involved in this weekend, uh, these are gatherings that people are involved in across this country and really uh, throughout the world, trying to come to terms with their objective realities, uh, trying to, uh, just to develop uh, new ways of seeing the world, uh, experimenting with with uh, uh, programs that they believe can bring more and more people into the fold of, of political activity and political opposition. And sometimes it may be uh, rough. We may have disagreements. Uh, we may not see things the, uh, the, the, the same, uh, but the process of struggle, the process of engagement, the process of study is something that we have to do. It is our responsibility for those of us who uh, have a, a sense of, 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 of what needs to happen. Uh, and therefore we have to embrace that responsibility. So I leave you with this, that you know we as human beings don't always have the ability to uh, determine the kind of conditions that we are born into. We have no control over that. But what we can control is how we respond to those conditions. Either we uh, go along with the status quo or we determine that we're going to struggle and we're going to fight and we're going to change the conditions we find ourselves in. So my friends, that is our responsibility. Uh, I uh, hope that uh, over these next two uh, days uh, that you are able to strengthen uh, the programmatic work uh, of of this uh, formation, this this coalition, um, and that uh, you leave with more clarity and more determination uh, that you came into this weekend with. So again, thank you so much for allowing me to be with you. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I'm hope hoping we can have uh, some conversation in in the Q and A. There's a number of issues we could talk about, uh, from the summit of the Americas to Ukraine and beyond. Uh, that we could touch on and we can touch on issues that are of, of vital importance domestically so again thank you my friends uh it's a pleasure and an honor to be here Jean thank you so so much really appreciate you lending those words to us um we're gonna get the chat back up here and uh, if you all have questions comments feel free to put them in the chat And uh, while we're doing that, I'll invite you to uh, pull up the schedule for tomorrow, which we'll talk about after we're done here. Chat going. Um, I'll, I'll start with a question, if you don't mind. Uh, I would really love to hear you speak a little bit about Ukraine and the perspective from the Black Alliance for Peace, um, if you wouldn't mind starting there. Okay. And uh, and I will make make it clear when I when I deviate from the uh, uh, position of the Black Alliance for Peace uh, and, uh, and and talking as an individual. But the, the Black Alliance of Peace, our position basically is that um, we are horrified by the situation in Ukraine. 
uh, on, on many levels. And the, the, the most primary level is that we understand that this, uh, this conflict um, could have been avoided. Uh, and we, we take the position that this conflict did not begin on February 24th of this year, uh, that this conflict started uh, back in 2014. And I don't want to have, I don't want to go through all of the, the details. Some of this is contested um, interpretations, but we say very clearly that um, the, the, the interference into the internal affairs of Ukraine by uh, the Obama administration uh, that resulted in um, a series of, of, of activities, including uh, the um, uh, uh, what we consider to be a coup uh, in February 2014, uh, and then the subsequent uh, conflict uh, when the people of the eastern Ukraine would not accept the legitimacy of the coup government, uh, and the coup government decided, uh, with the encouragement of the U.S., that they're going to uh, bring those their own citizens, Ukrainian citizens, uh, back into line by force. That that uh, set him into motion uh, where we ended up uh, today. Um, coming out of that conflict was a uh, a diplomatic off ramp called the Minsk Agreement, uh, and that agreement was put in place because the military uh, aspect of the conflict uh, was not successful. Uh, for various reasons, including support from uh, from the Russians. Um, but you had a, a limbo, and then you had the second phase of the conflict uh, that started after uh, eight years of U.S. military training, uh, the uh, um, uh, persuading the Trump administration to um, uh, go beyond the Obama constraints. Uh, they train, uh, the Obama administration trained forces and provided uh, military arms, but they were reluctant to provide uh, heavy weapons. Uh, that was reversed under Trump <laughs> um, and the preparations for a war were in place. When the Biden administration came into, into uh, power, one of the first things that they did in March of, of last year uh, was in essence to uh, let uh, the young uh, actor in Ukraine uh, know that if the Ukrainians uh, were prepared to uh, uh, reincorporate the Donbass and even uh, Crimea uh, through force, that they will be supported by the U.S. That became the that became strategy. It was objective. It's not something that's conspiratorial. That's it, it was it was talked about and done basically in public, including the strategic uh, uh, agreement that was uh, struck in December of of last of this of last year before they decided uh, that they're going to launch the uh, uh, the attacks in February. Uh, so they, they put a, over 100,000 troops along the contact line. Uh, they started the probing. The war really started, the second phase of the war started around February 15th. Uh, and we know that February 24th, the Russians uh, uh, went into uh, Ukraine. So we are horrified because this could have been uh, uh, prevented. We're even further um, appalled by the fact that once the conflict started uh, and there were negotiations taking place between the Ukrainians and, and the Russians, uh, there was a, a, a tentative almost agreement in the latter part of March that would have shortened the war, ensured that Ukraine could have maybe existed as a nation state, uh, that Biden sent uh, Boris, uh, Boris Johnson over to see uh, Zelensky and told them, in essence, if you agree or you continue to provide uh, concessions, we cannot uh, ensure your security. So I, I'm more, I went into more details than I wanted to, but it basically our position is that this has to stop. This conflict has had a, a, a negative impact, not only the people of, of Ukraine and Russia, the people who are dying unnecessarily, but we see the impact it's had on the global economy uh, with millions of people being negatively impacted by this unnecessary blunder by this incompetent administration in Washington. Well, thank you so much. Uh, a couple of questions from the chat. One is, uh, what's the most exciting organizing model or movement you've seen or are a part of working for the depth of transformative change that you advocate? That's a very good question. Um, um, well, as most people, many people don't know, I spend uh, a significant time um, in, in Colombia. 
um, and I was uh, a part of, if you will, uh, the successful, uh, well, the, the, the successful uh, electoral win in Colombia. Um, and uh, I'm a close uh, uh, friend with uh, the VP, Francia Marquez, who I've known since she's been a, since she, since she was a teenager. Um, and we, we remind people that what, in, what is important about Francia is that Francia is not an individual. France is not the uh, what you know our conception of like these bourgeois politics politicians in the in the in the West in the U.S. Uh, candidate centered who just you know show up and present themselves to the masses and say support me. No, Francia's uh, entry point into the electoral process was a result of a collective decision made by the Black uh, community process. Okay, she she does not operate as an individual. When well, there's certain uh, issues that were developing in the campaign, um, and there was a possibility she was going to pull out. Uh, she just couldn't make that decision herself. She had to, uh, they called an assembly, uh, and they made certain decisions, and one of them was that she would continue. So what I'm saying is that this level of, of political organization we have in Colombia, among the Black communities, uh, where we have the ability to, uh, to hold territory, uh, even though uh, our people have been uh, subjected to horrendous pressure uh, from the state, from paramilitary forces, and even uh, guerrilla forces, um, and the ability to reproduce a powerful organized apparatus uh, has rendered uh, 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 invaluable uh, lessons for for our movement and for me personally. So I would say Colombia is, is is the model. Thank you. Um... Capitalism fails to value work that centers people and ecology. What visions do you have for a different economic system where people and activities that center the well-being of people are valued more? Well, you know, we, we lay out the analysis of, of the contradictions of the system um, and we lay them out and then we say, or well, I say uh, quite clearly, that the these contradictions that we have in this system um, is uh, uh, explains why I am a socialist and why I believe in socialist uh, transformation, uh, why I believe that we have to have a socialist revolution. This uh, system uh, cannot address the needs that we have. It cannot uh, fulfill the, uh, the need we have for dignity. Uh, it has only produced uh, misery. And we have the technological base now where we, if it was uh, controlled by the people, uh, we have the value system that emanates from socialist principles, we, in fact, could live in harmony with each other, with other peoples, uh, and have the material basis that everybody can live dignified lives. The only reason that we aren't able to do that is because of the control uh, that these parasitic uh, gangsters, these criminals, um, um, uh, capitalists have uh, over the masses of the people of, of this planet. And that, is, that, and that will change. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering myself if you would talk about your idea about the role of electoral politics in a socialist revolution. Um, what's the, you mentioned that that's strategic. Could you talk about that? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, when, when I was running um, with Jill Stein in 2016, and many of many people here might remember that uh, the cornerstone of our, of our program was the Green New Deal. <laughs> the Green New Deal that uh, got uh, uh, co-opted and, and they, they eliminated a couple of major pieces of it and and all of a sudden it was a brilliant idea. Um, but you know when we pushed the Green New Deal, um, for us the Green New Deal was not an end in itself. It was a transitional program, a program for building power. Uh, so the for me, uh, my participation in the electoral process in 2016 was as a uh, as a process to build independent power, to build uh, a, a, a structure, an apparatus, a party uh, that in fact uh, might be in a position uh, to, um, to, to, to secure some spaces uh, in the state or the local um, uh, state and even national level. Uh, but again, not as an end in itself, 
but as a, a part of a broader strategy for building independent power. We're not going to uh, uh, we're not going to transform society through the electoral process. We can make some inroads though, and because millions of people participate in it, we have we have the responsibility to be in it also. Okay, but we're not going to perpetuate the myth uh, that. Uh, you know, this this capitalist uh, uh, dictatorship is going to uh, just turn over power to us. We know that before they do that, we have a phase of fascism uh, or new forms of fascism before that takes place, because we've always had fascism here uh, in this settler colonial state. Thank you so much for saying that. Uh, there's one comment here in the, in the chat uh, about your comments about the use of the word radical. It says, I can agree to the need for radical reorganization of society, um, et cetera, but uh, those are, the other folks are the radicals, I think is what I'm hearing. Um, we who want a just and rational society are not radicals, hence I would not consider myself radical. Do you have thoughts about this? Um, would you like to expand on that at all? Yeah, no, Mike, make, Mike made that comment in the breakout. And I, I just, I think I understand where, where he's coming from with that. I would just, I would, I would suggest to to Mike that you, you might want to think about this in a different kind of way, because there's sort of a, a implication that the the radical there's a, a sort of a negative connotation to being a radical. I'm flipping it and saying that the that to be a radical is 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 a good thing. That to be a radical one is in fact attempting to try to come to terms with objective realities in, in using reason, using rationality, going beneath the surface to the reality that is that this, this, this often hidden, going to the root of things. That's what a radical does, okay? So we wanna make sure we don't allow the opposition to define things for us and have us run away from terms and concepts. Uh, so I proudly, define myself as a radical. It is the uh, the bourgeoisie. It is the opposition that attempts to obscure reality, that attempts to keep us on the surface, that wants to uh, define uh, any forces that are in real opposition as uh, the forces that, that people should be concerned with, shy away from, and even condemn. So, you know, that is, that. so that term is something we, we need to maybe look at and think about in a slightly different way, Mike. Thanks for that. So uh, that's a good thing to keep in mind over the course of this weekend. Uh, that word's gonna be around a lot. And so there's a lot of opportunity to think about it. Thank you so much. Um, all right, I think that is all the questions from the chat. If there's anything else, feel free to put it there now, folks. Um, thank you so much. I see a lot of gratitude here. A lot of clarity. Really appreciate your words. Um, is there anything else you want to uh, say before we wrap up here? Again, just thank you for allowing me to to be with you for a while. Uh, unfortunately, I can't stay the rest of the weekend. Um, I'm actually uh, traveling, uh, but please, if you um, as you as you grapple with with, with issues, uh, let me remind folks of of some sources to go to for information, uh, please check out the uh, Black Agenda Report. Uh, I'm one of the contributing editors of that. Uh, get cutting edge, uh, radical analysis uh, there. So that's blackagendareport.com. Uh, please check it out at the um, uh, blackallianceofpeace.com. Uh, we are building a, a movement. Uh, we have um, uh, hundreds of, of young Black radicals that have uh, come to us over the last few years because the people are looking for uh, an alternative. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have built a, a, black, a, 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 a BAP solidarity network with uh, non-Africans. We refer to black people as Africans. Of uh, non-Africans who uh, work uh, 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 to advance the program of, of our formation, uh, we are building a movement. Uh, and and we, we just want to remind people that uh, movement building building organization is what we have to commit ourselves to. So please check out the Black Alliance of Peace. Uh, uh, help us out. Uh, we, we don't get uh, any uh, foundation resources. We go to the people hat in hand, uh, like you all do also. So uh, 
you know, any pen pennies that you might have that you don't give to move to the men, um, think about the Black Alaska piece. So thank you so much for having me and you all keep up the good work and we will meet uh, down the road. Oh, thank you so, so much. All right, folks, and I see uh, there's stuff coming in. We're gonna just keep sharing uh, those um, links as we go forward in the weekend. We've got a spreadsheet that has uh, links so you can donate to these organizations and check out everything that everyone's uh, dropping in the chat here. We'll also have space to submit further questions. Thank you so much, Ajami. We really appreciate you being here. Safe travels. All right, y'all, um, thank you so much. Um, that's, that's the first evening of the Radical Gathering, Cultivating the World We Deserve. Uh, thank you so much for sticking through it, being here. Um, just a couple of reminders that uh, tomorrow is gonna be so cool. So please uh, come back and bring your friends too. We're gonna start tomorrow um, at 9.30 Pacific. Um, 1230 Eastern, we're going to have really great content, including worker power, land and water protection, just transition, economic solutions. This is your brain on capitalism. Of course, the care team is around um, at the end of the day and to support you throughout. And I uh, just really appreciate you. And remember that as we go into the rest of the content of the weekend, we want to be thinking about what strategies are emerging, what patterns are emerging, and what ideas we have for the future of this, this group. So thank you all so much for being here and we'll see you uh, tomorrow. Have a great evening, everybody.